very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's very exciting. Uh, it's very different from uh, the kind of things that I do or know about. So uh, this uh, paper requires uh, just uh, two brief uh, apologies. So first of all, it's a very weird paper. It's certainly not about finance, and I know nothing about finance. Uh, the other apology is that uh, this is the first time that this is being presented. It has already been rejected once, but it hasn't been presented to an audience, so um, we'll just go with this and see how it, how it goes. So uh, I'll tell you first what it's about, and then I'll try to not to do too much of the details because there's a lot of notation and very little results, and it could be frustrating. Um, what it's about is about four different distinctions and somewhat, uh, I don't know, agendas that I'm, I'm somewhat uh, promoting with some colleagues. And the point is that at some point we realize that there is a, some common structure and that, that to an extent that we thought that maybe a, mo a formal model is needed to see the analogies between them. Uh, the group of uh, the same uh, set of courses, Andy Postlewaite, Larry Samuelson, David Schmeidler and I, uh, have written a paper about uh, methodology, about economics in particular, saying that one way to look at what econo economists do with the models is that they look for analogies more than general rules. Okay, so in that uh, other methodological paper, which I'm not presenting here now, um, what we try to understand actually the sort of a sociology of science paper, so taking a, the descriptive paper, trying to understand how come economists feel that we understand so much from our models, but when we look around, people look at us and say, what is this? Okay. So uh, in particular, I'm married to a psychologist, and from time to time, I'm trying to tell her about something that really excites me, and she looks at this and says, what is this a model of exactly? Because to experimental psychologists, a lot of what we do seems like not science at all. Uh, when we talk to other people, uh, okay, the, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of heat, you know, physicists uh, don't think that we do serious science. And with all these things, and you know, and then the come people from you know, the Kahneman Tversky and their school and show that everything that we say is false and being violated in a lab, and we go about our business happily, sort of shrugging our shoulders and still feeling that we understand something, that we have this warm feeling inside that we still do something good and still figure out something. So it's sort of this kind of uh, sociological puzzle, sociology of science puzzle that we're uh, trying to uh, say something about. The first paper uh, was specifically about that and says, let's think of economic models not only as generalizations, whenever you are in this kind of situation, therefore blah, blah, blah. So that if you think about something in particular, think of the toy models like Akilov uh, Lemon's model, okay? So don't try to take it only as a general statement about whenever you have a buyer and seller, et cetera. But here is a story, and maybe next time that you see something in real life, it, you'd see some analogy to this story. And analogies or case-based reasoning is another way to think um, in general in life, in statistics, in psychology, and in science, we argue. Um, people think in terms of general rules, uh, but also in terms of analogies. Okay. Um, we also apply the same kind of methodology to our thoughts about what we do. So to use big words, it'll be, it'll be the philosophy of the field. But if we're trying to understand the kind of thing that we're doing, it's a sort of a social science, because there is a group of scientists who are doing something and are producing papers and are feeling good about themselves and are you know, making money, etc. And we ask ourselves, let's take this phenomenon, the social science phenomenon. There are this group of people who are, by and large, pretty smart, and they think that they do something useful, and we're trying to understand how come they think that they're doing something useful. Okay? So we're trying to model that. Now here, uh, in these four distinctions that I'll go over one by one, uh, when we started seeing that there is uh, some similarity between them, we thought, well, maybe this is what we typically do in economics. We write down a simple model that's not supposed to be a perfect model of any of these phenomena, but maybe just highlight the common aspect of what a lot of the other the four phenomena. Okay? And the most relevant uh, to uh, this discussion, I think, would be the last one. But let me first start with the, uh, these uh, four distinctions. I'll allow myself to uh, speak about them, and uh, as the presenter said, once we get into the formal model, I'm not sure you'll, you'll be very excited, because when you start to put all of these things together in one model, 
I think invariably it's a cumbersome model. So we'll get to it. I'll show you something so that you won't be too frustrated for not having anything formal. But I warn you ahead of time that's going to be heavy annotation relative to what we have to say with that. Okay, uh, so let me start with the first thing. The first thing is whether the sort of distinction that for want of better name I would call theories and paradigm, I should warn ahead of time we're not using paradigm in the exact sense that Kuhn uh, used the term, uh, but more in the everyday usage that maybe people in our field are, are using them. Um, so basically, when we think about theories, we are thinking about concrete concepts, and we, most economists are brought up on the Popperian view that theories should be refutable, and we should be able to say something that can be tested, and if it is refuted, we, we have a problem. But at least we know that the theory used to be meaningful, uh, revealed preference, as an example, things of that nature. And we believe that this is a guideline in, in economics so that you, you know, write a paper and if it doesn't have anything, theories observationally indistinguishable from something else, the referees are going to give you a hard time on that. On the other hand, some of the things that we call theories, and in particular I'm thinking about decision theory and game theory, are not so obvious uh, theories in this sense. Okay? And there is a feeling that you can do a lot in terms of the interpretation. Actually, the freedom of interpretation of concepts is what this talk is, is about. Um, so if I'm thinking about a decision problem under certainty, I'm using the term alternative. But alternative can be something concrete that we see now. It could be a stream of consumption. It could be many other things that we can put into in the model in, say, behavioral economics. I'm talking about decision under uncertainty, there are such concepts as state of the world and outcome. So a state of the world is something that can happen, but um, I have some freedom in deciding what are the states in my model. Game theory adds a layer of uh, freedom there when I have to decide who is the player and what is the strategy and things of this nature. Um, so just to give a, a very simple example, is, um, suppose that you're thinking about the U.S. negotiating with Iran these days, and I'm asking you whether this, what you see is or is not in accordance with game theoretic predictions. Well, the answer is, it depends. Okay? So if you think of the U.S. as a player, or some, you have one analysis, and someone else would say, wait a minute, maybe you should separate. There's a president, there's Congress, there are at least two players. What you thought of is a choice of a strategy by a single player is actually an equilibrium outcome. So there is some freedom in the way we use the concepts. This freedom can make uh, these, these so-called theories uh, meaningless or irrefutable. Uh, and let me just go over a couple of, of classroom examples. Um, classroom in the sense that they show up in our classes. So, for instance, there is the ultimatum game, which is a very famous um, game, starting with uh, Werner Vern Guth and the... No, I guess everyone knows the story. One player uh, splits, the other one says yes or no. Uh, and then often this is quoted as something that refutes um, game theory or something like that. Okay. Now, obviously, we can't refute game theory with a game as simple as that. Okay? And, uh, what we teach our students is that we assign utilities to the outcomes after we observe choice, that the revealed preference paradigm. So if a player chose this versus the other, then they Evidently, we have to assign to it a higher utility, so you cannot really refute the theory this way. Okay. Um, then what you do, you say, well, there are other things that, are, that matter here. Maybe it's a matter of pride. Maybe it's a matter of reputation. Maybe it's concern about equity. God knows what, but we could put them back in. So what we are basically doing is redefining the concept of a consequence or an outcome. If the outcome was supposed to be that I'm going to have, say, 80 euros, then say, no, it's not 80 euros, it's 80, 80 euros with the knowledge that the other person okay, is going to get 20 or something like that. Um, so on the one hand, we could salvage game theory by saying, no, the outcomes are different from what you thought. The outcome is not just the amount of money. There are psychological and sociological factors that determine how desirable the outcome is. Once you put them in, there's no problem. But then sometimes you could get a question from a student who says, well, wait a minute, but is there anything that you cannot explain this way? Let's think about another example. Uh, framing effects, which Kahneman and Tversky documented in their uh, famous experiments, show that people react to the way that the problem is presented. You tell uh, 
Even sophisticated decision makers, a story with 70% probability of survival versus 30% probability of death, and it turns out it's not the same. I mean, the reactions is different, so that people react to the, the framing of, of the story, to the representation of the alternatives. But then you could stop and say, and I think the first time I heard it was from my uh, colleague Eud Kalai at Northwestern at the time, say, well, wait a minute, that's not, not quite right, because suppose that I'm, let me, I mean, his example was a, bit, a little bit unfair, but let me retell the example. I said, suppose I'm sitting with my doctor, and my doctor says, look, there's 99% probability you're going to survive, versus my doctor says, there's one probability, 1% 1 probability that you're going to die. It feels different. Now, this example is not really fair because 99% and 1% are not real numbers. They're really manners of speech. Okay? But so if my doctor tells me there's 1% probability that you're not going to survive, I'm asking myself, why did you choose to talk about that? Maybe it reflects something else that's maybe not in the numbers. But even if I were to put real numbers, not meta metaphors, uh, there is some difference because the very fact that my doctor decided to use a certain representation is informative in and of itself. And that's what we teach our students, okay? We teach our students that everything should matter, including the channel by which you got the information. Okay, we have the three door story that, you know, the Monty Hall paradox with, I guess, everyone's... You know, there used to be a TV game, uh, at least many years in the States, then I've seen it el elsewhere, that uh, you have a candidate that has to choose one of three doors, and then the moderator allows you to switch. Is this very, um, anyone has never seen that? Or? Whatever, okay, so it, it's analyzed in various places. Uh, okay, I'll give another uh, tribute to, to another Northwestern colleague. So at the time, we used to teach it in probability classes at Kellogg, and uh, I used to think it was just for fun, but uh, Roger Meyerson, who was teaching the same class at the time, said, no, 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 it's very important. And if you know Roger, you know that he's, he's, he's very, he believes in, in, in ideas. And he said, no, it's very important because they should learn that the way that you got information tells you something beyond the information itself, okay, which is a lot of what information economics is about. You ask yourself, even if the person is only truth-telling, not only what he said is the information, but the fact that he chose to say this and not something else. And the Grice principle in, in um, philosophy of language is a similar kind of thing, assuming that you're going to say the simplest thing that, uh, that is correct. So if you ask me if I'm going to be at the office, I'll say I'll be at the office from 4 on, then you realize I probably will not be at the office until 4, even though that's not what I said. But you do this Bayesian reasoning about what signal I received, what signal I could have received. You have to put some assumptions about the preferences of the other party. Is he on your side? And is it a coordination game or not? Okay. But we do teach our students that the channel by which we got information is informative. But this, in some sense, says that there is no such, no such thing as framing effect. Right? Because if you take one of the classical examples of the classical successes of behavioral economics, the 401k example, where you change the default on a form, and you find that people choose something else. Okay? So you could opt into a program or opt out. Well, of course, this is what you should be doing. Okay? Because if I'm going through these pages and pages of a form, and you ask me what should I do, I have some theory about other people who maybe have more time or more patience to this than I do. And I do want to free ride them cognitively. And I say, if this is the default, probably this is the standard in this, in this society. Okay? If I have to opt in or opt out from an organ donation program, I see what the default is. The default gives me a signal about what's the norm in that society. Okay? So it's not framing, okay? because there are no two identical problems. There's real information conveyed to you by the representation. But this goes back to says, wait a minute, if there is no such thing as framing effect, it means that you could explain everything because whatever it is that I ask you, you could say, oh, the very fact that you asked me already conveyed some information, so now anything and everything can be explained. Last example of this type, uh, I'll go on soon, is uh, consequentialism. So consequentialism, if you write it down, it's something like saying we have a certain tree, a decision tree, which could be part of a game. And all that matters should be the continuation of the tree. Once I'm at a certain point, I should only look at the subtree and not care about what has done, what has happened before. Um, in particular, we use this as a tool to um, sort of get immune uh, versus um, problems of sunk cost. 
So if we show students that sunk cost is a problem, then people are prone to that and say, here is a way to immune yourself against sunk cost. Use decision trees, you look at the tree from now on, and therefore whatever, was, whatever brought you up there was, shouldn't matter. Good. But if you push it a little bit too far, you'll find out that you'll never be grateful to anyone for anything, okay? So if I tell my students, um, Next time you, okay, you're gonna meet me at some point, I'm gonna be old, you shouldn't feel any gratitude to your old professor because this is something that belongs to the past. Let bygones be bygones, right? So no, that's not exactly what we mean, okay? So if, uh, if I'm your professor really helps you a lot, one day, 30 years from now, you're going to meet me, I do expect you to be grateful, okay? Which is part of your payoff, is to be grateful to someone who helped you. But once I cross that line, once I'm allowing something of the past to be part of the outcome, then again, consequentialism becomes devoid of content. Okay? Because if I'm allowing the past or the path that brought me there to be part of the outcome as I do when I have guilt feelings or gratitude or whatever, then consequentialism is devoid of content also. Okay? So, uh, the feeling is that especially in the more abstract fields of microeconomics and decision theory, game theory. It's not so true of microeconomics, of classical microeconomics, but when you think about decision and game theory, since we have so much freedom in determining who are the players and what are the strategies and what are the states of the world and what, people, what is an outcome and, and so on, it's not really a theory in the Popperian sense. We're not really committing, but when we're doing at least decision game theory proper, we're not committing to anything. What we are providing is a certain framework to think about it. Now, sometimes people use the word language. I don't think it's more than a language, because when you have decision theory, say, with expected utility maximization, it says something. When you have the framework of game theory with Nash equilibria, it also says something. It's not only a language. It's a bit more. But it's, it still allows for a host of different interpretations in terms of what it is going to say. Um, and then, yes, this reminds me often of this uh, quote from Amos Tversky when, uh, evidently, it was a long time ago, uh, I was talking about how people react to um, claims that a certain theory doesn't work and that they can redefine things, etc. And then he told me, yes, theories are not refuted, they are embarrassed. It just becomes embarrassing to hold on to a given theory. And what I mean by uh, this in this context is that, yes, you could almost always revive it, but at some point the interpretation becomes embarrassing. Okay? Show me any result of an experiment, and if you want to see how, why it is consistent with expected utility maximization, I'll tell you, because the subject had this state of the world in their mind, in which if they don't do what they actually did, little green people from Mars are going to come and kidnap them. Okay? So I can always accommodate any kind of behavior with the standard notion, but at some point, you know, it'll be ridiculous. Okay? So it's not really whether the theory was, a, there was a clear-cut refutation of the theory, but rather whether the kind of interpretation of the concept I need to, to have to make it hold become at some point embarrassing. Okay? So there's something about an informal judgment of what's a reasonable interpretation, what is not, and if I have to tell you that all these people in the lab were afraid of being kidnapped by aliens, at some point I'll just be embarrassed and shut up. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's the first uh, distinction. Let me go move on to the second. Um, so something that sort of bothers me for many years is what is rationality? Um, I remember, uh, embarrassing long time ago, uh, 25 years ago, um, I was at a conference uh, in decision theory, somewhere in the OR conference, and uh, Peter Fishburne uh, was there. So Peter Fishburne is uh, you know, an authority in decision theory. When I was a student, I studied by his books. And he was presenting there a, uh, um, a model in which people might have cyclical preferences. Strict preference was cyclical. There was some, something else going on, some structure, axioms, results, and at some point he got a question from the audience about the rationality of all this story of why would people have cyclical preferences, and he responded somewhat annoyingly saying, annoyedly said, there's nothing irrational about cyclical preferences. 
Now, this was a half an hour talk, and this was the great Peter Fishburne, so no one argued with him. But I went out of this asking myself, what does he mean when he said that there is nothing irrational about cyclical preferences? What do we mean by rationality? And um, the first notion that um, um, later on suggested with David Schmeiler in the, uh, in the book on case-based decision theory is that um, something is rational for, to a person, for a certain person, a decision is rational if by talking about it, by analyzing it, I cannot make you feel bad about the decision. I cannot embarrass you. I cannot want you to change your mind or something like that. So it's a very subjective notion. Um, it's subjective. It's going to be an empirical issue if I take this notion of rationality. So what I mean by transitivity is that if I see you going to make a decision that is, or I see that your decisions are cyclical and I show it to you, I believe that most people would feel bad about it. They would feel bad about themselves. It would not fit their self-image or whatever. They might be embarrassed. I do lots of these things when I use Kahneman Tversky's examples in class to teach decision theory, and you see that people don't like this kind of thing. Some would argue with you, some would uh, say, okay, I've been stupid, and stuff like that. So um, you, there is some notion of unease that they feel. But it's not something I can see on behavior. I need to talk to the person to see how they feel and maybe give them a second chance later on, but I need something to converse with. Uh, it's going to vary from one subject to another. It's going to be very fuzzy. Uh, whether something is rational or not, I have to test empirically. I cannot just sit by the blackboard and write down that transitivity and completeness and continuity is rationality, period. I mean, I have to give up some of my authority as a theorist. Um, well, still, this is, definition of rationality is not also not monotonic in intelligence. And this is something that I discovered once the hard way. So I was trying to teach uh, von Neumann Morgenstern uh, in class by getting the students to make the mistakes of Kahneman Tversky or something, or a Le paradox. And after they made the mistake, to show them that they don't satisfy the axiom, and then say, aha, you want to satisfy the axiom, you have to be expected utility maximizer. So that was the plan of the class. But after I tricked them to make the wrong decision, I started to explain the axiom. And many of them just didn't get it. Okay, so I drew trees, and I showed that this tree is like that tree, and you can move here, and the probabilities, and I was jumping up and down and sweating all over, and it didn't work. They were just not convinced. Okay? I had to agree that, by my definition, it was rational for them to behave, to violate the axiom. Okay? Or when I say non-monotonic in intelligence, I mean that I can have two decision makers who make the same decisions, and then I come to them and explain it to them. One of them is brilliant and sees the point and feels bad about it, and the other one is stupid and doesn't see any, the point. The brilliant one is irrational, and the stupid one is rational, according to my definition. Okay? Why am I still using this, 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 this notion? Why do I think it's the right uh, notion, or notion with, with some, some value? So first of all, I'm trying to adopt a more, I don't know what to call it, democratic, egalitarian approach. I don't view rationality as a medal of honor that we decision theorists bestow upon the decision makers. Okay? So rather, I think that uh, it should be something that facilitates the discourse between the decision maker and decision theorist, but I don't think that we hold the key to what rationality is. Okay? The way I view the situation in decision theory these days is that we have two fantastic bodies of literature. One is what I would call the rational choice paradigm, which consists of decision theory and game theory and Savage and Arrow and von Neumann and all these, this fantastic intellectual achievement of the 20th century. Uh, and on the other hand, there is what comes out from the psychology school of, uh, you know, the school of Kahneman Tversky, and this doesn't work and that doesn't work. And uh, again, Amos Tversky famously said, give me the axiom, I'll design the experiment that violates it. And as we all know, it was not pure bragging. I mean, everything he did more or less come up with a, an example for everything. And the question is, what do we do? What do we do when we see such a beautiful, nice theory on the one hand and so many refutations on the other hand? Well, uh, there are a couple of things to do. One thing to do is to run away and say, okay, I want to do something else. Let's do math. It used to be beautiful. It probably still is beautiful. And forget about these social sciences. They're too messy. Uh, but if we are in the business of, of the social sciences, then uh, grosso modo there are two things that we can do. Either we can try to bring the theory closer to reality, which is what behavioral economics is trying to do. 
So if the theory doesn't work, let's change it so that it, it works. But we can do another thing that we cannot do in the natural sciences, and this is to bring reality closer to the theory. We could go to high school and start teaching kids how to think about these problems. We can try to start teaching them what is probability and what statistics. Make them sensitive to some of these things. And maybe instead of benefiting from this in terms of better marketing strategies, we will have a generation of people who make better decisions in their own eyes. Okay? According to their own judgment, they will like their decisions better. Okay? And that's exactly the decision of which one I should do is exactly my definition of rationality. So my definition of rationality, empirical and messy and, and subjective as it is, is trying to ask for how many of the people should you teach them this stuff Will they change their behavior and next time make decisions that they like better? And in how many of these cases it won't work? So for example, if you take the framing effect, and I do it in classes very often, I have yet to meet a student who feels okay with framing effect. Okay? Everyone feels embarrassed by making different decisions by different frames, and you have a feeling that they learn something and next time they're gonna be immune to that. By the way, this is also something that happened to me once when I came with a list of Kahneman Tversky examples and nothing worked until a student eventually pitied me and said, we have seen all of this in another class. <laughs> so um, you have a feeling that if you show it to them once or twice, they get the principle next time they want to do the same mistake. But if you tell them, uh, you know, you should play chess optimally, okay? It's not a useful thing to do. Even if you convince them, you know, you do Tzamelo's uh, theorem and you prove to them that there is a winning strategy to one or the other or, or strategies that, are, that draw, you haven't changed the behavior at all. Okay? Or if you tell them, uh, okay, try to find a path in a graph, Hamiltonian path in a graph, and they can't do it, and you show it to them in one graph, next time they will not be able to do it either. Okay? So if they're faced with problems that are computationally hard, they might even not be embarrassed because they could say, how could I have, I know, how could I have known that there is something else? I mean, there are myriads of possibilities I could not have known, and I'm not going to do anything differently next time. With all due respect, and if it's not exactly the same graph or exactly the same chess position, next time I'm faced with something like this, I'll be as irrational as I used to be. So you could call me irrational as long as you wish, but it's not going to change anything in my behavior. And that's the way I'm using the term rationality. Later on, uh, and um, <coughs> this also appeared in a paper with um, David and, and uh, Massimo Marinacci and, and Fabio Maccheroni, we try to distinguish, to refine this between two notions of rationality, and this is where it's getting closer to the topic of this paper. Um, so rationality is about rhetoric, it's about convincing people, in this sense it's, it's getting close to things that Habermas uh, wrote about. The notion of rationality I'm trying to suggest is something that has to do with sort of robustness to a public discourse. But then if you think about it, there are different notions or different ways to look at it. And on two extremes, I would put the objective versus subjective rationality. Something is objectively rational if I can go and convince every reasonable person, quote unquote, that this is the right thing to do. So I'd say that today, I think that I can convince every reasonable person that smoking is bad for you. Okay? I'm not saying I can convince you not to smoke, but at least I can tell you, look, evidence is such that you really need to do all kinds of men incredible mental acrobatics in order to argue that there is no proof for that. Okay? Uh, cell phones, I don't think that we know so much about. Whether cell phones are or not uh, bad for us, and I think that as far as I could tell, uh, this is not so clear. So science, attempting to use statistics and objective evidence and so on, can prove certain things, certain hypotheses that null hypothesis can be uh, rejected, and that's what we expect to be objective knowledge. Okay? Something that every reasonable person should admit that it's probably true, and the chance that we are, however, you're going to be Bayesian about it or not, you more or less accept this statement. Sub I'm sorry. Sorry, Rob, but I think it, this seems like you know, should place the word rational with reasonable. And I know you said quote unquote reasonable, but you know, it's almost like a reasonable person is. Like, you know, oh, no, no, no. That's the, that, 
this is a completely, no, reasonable person would be anything that is not in an asylum. So as far as I know, so, no, the thanks, I, I, but I think this is a, a very important point. So, I mean, I'm, I think you know this, this old joke about the guy who's driving down the I-95. Okay, so the guy is driving down the I-95, gets a phone, a phone call from his wife, says, John, be careful, there's a crazy guy dri driving in the wrong direction on the I-95. Is this one crazy guy? So, whether I'm in the driving uh, in the wrong direction or all, all of you is eventually determined only by power, okay? So when we, if at some point people would come in with, uh, uh, during this talk, would chain me and take me to an asylum, I can keep yelling at you, no, but I'm rational and you should all be in asylum, but I'll be locked up. And as far as, I, so I'm, I'm extremely subjectivist and I'm even solipsistic in this. I don't, I don't have any reference to an, a truth out there. Um, so irrespective of your philosophical position, I think in the social sciences, I think it's a healthy starting point to say that eventually majority is going to determine that, okay? So Habermas on this puts a bit more into this. He puts more democratic values than I would need for this definition. Let's say if I'm in North Korea right now and you take me away, then I'll be irrational and I'll, no matter what I believe when I'm in jail, okay? So uh, you're asking what is reasonable or not, I'd say this is only something that's going to be determined by majority vote or power or something like that. I wish I had access to some truth which is beyond that. I don't, personally I don't, okay? But anyway, uh, I just want to focus right now on, two, on these two extremes. So on objective rationality, I want something that I, I believe I can convince most people, the court of law or something like this, I would convince you that every reasonable person would have acted this way. Uh, on subjective rationality, I, I allow you to do whatever you like, I just don't want you to be convinced that what you've done is wrong. Okay? So if you think about a doctor who is going to have some um, malpractice lawsuit, for subjective rationality, all you need to do is to say, this could have been justified, given what I knew, given the evidence we had, this was a reasonable kind of thing to do, which is different from saying this is the only thing to do. Okay, so it's and as in this paper, what you typically expect is that subjective rationality would be a complete binary relation because of necessity, we need to make decisions, so we want it to be complete, we want the decision to be in the model, so we make it a, a complete. But the price of the completeness is that it's very subjective and tied to Bayesian analysis, Bayesian statistics. Objective rationality would tend to be incomplete because there are so many things that science doesn't quite know what the answer is, closer, closer to classical statistics like not being able to reject neither H0 nor its negation. Okay, um, next. What is decision theory good for? So um, part of my life I've been spending in business schools and teaching stuff and then, you know, there are re sometimes students want decision theory to be more or less like what operations research used to be. And some wonderful success of operations research brought me here today in 33 minutes because you put Google Maps or better even than that you use Waze or something tells you about traffic. You say the software knows where you want to be. Um, I think the notion of an address is going to disappear pretty soon. I got here this morning on time without, being, without really knowing the address of the place. Okay? So you just cut, cut and paste, you put it in, it's immediately in your smartphone and it tells you where to drive. You don't need to know where you're driving, you don't need to know the name of the street. The feasible set is clear. The program knows the feasible set better than I do. The objective function, okay, you just say fastest route and that's it. Okay? The problem is solved. Wonderful. It's not so easy when you're thinking about, you know, how do I invest the money, my money? Suppose someone comes and tells me, what should I do? How should I invest my money? And then I say, you know, the very fact that you have money to invest probably proves that your intuition is much better, much better than mine, okay? So how could I tell you whether, you know, the Eurozone is going to survive, yes or not? I mean, I learned a lot this morning, but I mean, from here to, Giving advice to people, wow, that'll be a huge leap for me, okay? However, as a decision theorist, I could still, still say, look, you have a certain, you have your intuition, you know what you want to do with your money. Let's just check and see how reasonable it is, and let me help you to construct a decision theory that would sort of post hoc, even if you haven't actually pushed the button. But after you made your reasoning, which can be very 
uh, emotional, intuitive, whatever, I'll try to justify it given that. So you're going to invest in this, and uh, so why are you thinking about, you think about this? Okay, I'll call it the state of the world. What it is that you want, you want that, okay. And now let's see what kind of probabilities I need to put on the state of the world. Let's see what kind of utility function I should put there to justify your decision. And if it's a simple two by two thing, that's great. But if I'm filling out pages over pages, or if I'm, then you might see some problem in your reasoning. Or if I have to put some states of the world in which uh, there's 50% probability of the world coming uh, to an end. Or maybe I'm just putting into your utility function things that you didn't know that they were there, that you didn't uh, think that you put so, so much value in. You find out that prestige is hugely important to you and you didn't know that, okay? So I could, as a decision theorist, put some, help you in making a decision just by checking the logic of your own decision. And I'm trying to say that this is a great value of decision theory, even when it cannot come up with the answer is in the example of the shortest path. Because I don't know exactly what uncertainty is there, I don't know exactly what are your goals, what's important to you, and I might not ever have a scientific answer for that. But I can try to see whether it works. Whether something that you like to do, whether you think you would like to do, fits into one of these models. And there's a whole gamut of things in between. That was distinction number four. I hope you were a three. I'm sorry. I hope you keep track. So what we've been talking about so far is the uh, theories and paradigms, uh, whether like decision on game theory is a theory or just a way to think about the world. Uh, two notions of rationality, objective, which you could, I can convince more or less everyone that this is the right thing, vis-a-vis -vis you cannot convince me that's the wrong thing. And the two ways to use decision theory. Um, which is part, by the way, of a bigger debate of whether intuition is, is useful or not. I mean, you, you have the, you know, among the uh, psychologists, you have uh, the school of thought of Gigerenzer, who's saying that you know, people make much more rational decisions. Intuition works much better than Kahneman Tversky would have us believe, because in the normal context, people make decisions that are much better, including examples of traders in the stock market who are doing, in their context, uh, intuition works best. Vis-a-vis -vis Kahneman Tversky, or more strongly uh, Thaler, who say that people have these mistakes and biases. What's common, by the way, from a, a business school's perspective, what's common to both extremes is that the students like them both because they tell the, the students that they don't need us. Okay? Either because intuition is perfect, as Gigerenzo says, and they don't need us, or with the mistakes cannot be fixed, and again, they don't need us. Okay? So part of what I'm trying to say in decision theory is sort of a survival battle. I'm trying to convince why decision theory is useful after all, and that's part of what I'm trying to say here, that often thinking in those terms is good just to see how robust is your decision or, or how reasonable is your decision. The last thing I want to talk about, last uh, thing, is the way to think about economics. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we talked about um, economic models as a sort of analogy. Um, but even when we have analogies, as long as we specify what is the similarity function, then we have a way to make predictions. Okay? This is getting to be technically very similar to kernel estimation in, or non-parametric more generally. Um, just thinking in terms of analogies rather than general rules doesn't mean that I do not make predictions, okay? If I tell you what are the analogies, and if I give you an algorithmic way to measure similarity and how to use it, then I can pre generate predictions as in kernel estimation. But I'm trying to say that there is yet another way to look at what we do in economics, which would be more relevant, less relevant to different fields, and this is just as a way of critique, of field of criticism. Okay. So what I mean by this is that there are statements that are being suggested, and people are saying things. Journalists, politicians have all kinds of policies in mind, all kinds of reasoning. Our job might be, one possible job of economists, uh, finance people, is just to, to sit there and see that what they're saying makes sense. Okay? So think about it as some kind of a reasoning police or logic police. We are sitting there and we're supposed to see that they haven't crossed any lines. And the kind of mistakes that people make vary. So sometimes it's just a pure logical mistake. You know? So you listen to a politician and they say A and therefore B and you say, wait a minute, A doesn't imply B. Okay, that's, that's classical. Another thing that happens a lot to us is that people say things that don't, do not sound like an equilibrium. Okay? And 
economists, people who studied economics, but certainly at the graduate level, are trained to look for these kind of things. And someone suggests, say, you know, we're going to reduce taxes and this is going to happen. If what they describe is not an equilibrium, something feels fishy. And here I claim we could do a lot of good by finding out these kind of mistakes, even if we can't say what will actually happen. Okay? And one example that is maybe not a perfect one is the Leifer curve example from the 70s in the Ford administration, where Leifer famously drew on a napkin uh, in revenue from income that increasing income tax doesn't necessarily mean that you get more revenue. Okay? Very simple economic uh, equilibrium analysis. Okay? Leifer, at least at the time when he did it, didn't know exactly whether it will or it will not. I hear that today people say that actually the U.S. was on the increasing part of the curve. Maybe. The point is not that. The point is that the value of the, of the critique of the argument is there even if you cannot make predictions. Okay? You can save a lot of trouble sometimes just by pointing out that something is not an equilibrium and incentives are not taken into account or something of that nature. I think empirical work and experimental work is sometimes served, also serves this kind of purpose that without necessarily committing to anything, you know, you come up with a story and I say, well, you know, it doesn't quite match with the data. And here economists, and this is also something, you know, sort of classroom discussions when I, I'm teaching uh, kids who are not yet committed to economics. So with graduate students, we don't have so much problem. With the undergraduates that are still not quite committed to us, whether it's by indoctrination or selection bias, uh, that are before that. So uh, they come there and have a feeling, oh, you haven't predicted the crisis and things like that. And we can have lots of excuses. Some of them are quite good, um, including you know, not being able to predict uh, earthquakes and so on. Um, but another thing I'm telling them, you know what? Let's start with lower aspirations. Don't think of what you do, we do here as science. Think of it as historians. I mean, similar to what historians are doing. Sometimes it's really going to converge if you think about economic history. Okay? Suppose I were to sit here and say, hey guys, I have this wonderful idea, let us all have common property and each of us is going to work as hard as we can and we're going to consume as little as we need and we'll have a wonderful society, right? And you'd expect someone in the back of the room say, look, I've heard about once uh, someone tried this, it didn't quite work out that well. Okay, so history does give us a way, of, a way to, to critique certain reasoning. Uh, but in general, empirical work does serve this purpose. But in principle, what I have in mind mostly are uh, examples, again, from uh, applied game theory or things like this. You have a two-by-two two model, which is, again, not a model of anything. It's way too simple. And yet, it does highlight a certain aspect, and it can show that another reasoning, which might have been enticing, might have some flaws. Okay, so let's get to the paper. Um, so the, the paper is to say that there is a common structure to these four distinctions and we could try to capture it by a formal model. Okay? And then the formal model would capture, capture only part of each one of them but would focus on the common thing. Um, okay, just to give a gist of the kind of formal model why I'm saying this is it's going to be heavy. So if I'm thinking about decision theory, then I have uh, things like, okay, act A means that A is an act, and then I have some preference of this is a two-place predicate, this is a single-place predicate. And the theory, like transitivity, could be saying something like this. If you have these two statements, then you have that one. Okay, so that's, that's an example of what I mean by uh, a theory. Let's take example, another example, I'm thinking about game theory, and I want to describe the battle of the sexes, which is just cute, simple two-by-two two game that we all know, and look how messy it looks. Because to describe it, I would have to say, okay, we have one predicate is who are the players, then what are the acts, that A1 is the act of player one, okay, so the list of strategies that they can take. Possible outcomes, if A, whoops, I'm sorry, if, Head, sorry. If uh, player one chooses this and player two chooses that, then this is going to be the result. So here's the, the payoff, the, I'm sorry, the outcome matrix. Then you have the payoff matrix by these preferences. And what I want to do is that to say the prediction of all these stories to say that one and four are equilibria and these are the only pure equilibria. Okay? So this is just to give a gist of how complicated it is to 
talk about a model without saying what this model is about, whether it's about um, just a single player or a single decision maker or two. So more generally, um, to simplify notation, since we have lots of um, an economic model, we can have lots of different predicates, like what is a player, what is a strategy, what is growth, what is uh, an economy, and so on. Um, we find it easier to think about uh, there is a set of entities which just abstract set. Uh, a k-place predicate is going to say yes or no for um, um, k-tuples. But it's more easier to define all the predicates on all the possible finite sequences. So I just take the union of all finite sequences, but I put a, sample, a special symbol to say this uh, isn't relevant. Okay? So a description of a situation is going to be an assignment of values for each predicate and each k-tuple of entities where for the most part it would say that it's irrelevant because if it used to be really a k-tuple predicate then for any m that is not k it would say this is irrelevant and for the rest it would say whether the relation holds for this k-tuple or not. Okay? So um, notation is a little heavy but then we have a set of descriptions for a set E uh, of entities and a set F of predicates. F, the predicates here are also just names here. Okay? So, Right now, the predicate F doesn't say anything. It could be a player, it could be an act, uh, but it's just a, a word. Uh, so if I go back to describe, say, the dictator game in this language, then I'll have to say, okay, the entities are the following. There are two players. Here are the acts of player one, and then the other outcomes. Uh, the predicates that are relevant for my story is players, acts, outcome, result, prefers may, may for the equilibrium. What I'm predicting is may happen. I'm trying to describe the game, so it says, okay, uh, player one is a, is a, I mean, P1 is a player, so this is true. Uh, P1 is not an act, just in case you were wondering. No, the answer is not, it's not an act. Um, zero is not a player, zero is an act, okay? So I really have to describe everything and anything, a lot of redundancy in this notation, but mathematically it's relatively more elegant than what could have been the case. And then I'm describing preferences to say, yes, uh, player one does prefer the outcome 1000 zero to the outcome 99.1, so the value is one for this. If you change the role, the answer is no, so it's strict preference, blah, blah, blah. But you can imagine how the notion of a description can describe a game and more things than that. Okay. okay. Uh, descriptions are going to be compatible if they agree, first of all, on what's relevant and what's not. Okay, so we, they agree on what's going to be a categorical mistake, like that player one cannot be an act or something like that. Uh, and uh, whenever they give values that are meaningful, then if, if both of them give meaningful values, then they have to be the same. What did I say uh, meaningful? I didn't say what I, uh, what's the star was. Uh, this means don't know. Not irrelevant, but don't know. So at the beginning of the description, there are many things I don't know. I want the theory to complete it by saying what's going to happen. So basically, what I'm driving at is to say that the theory takes a description and fills out some of these stars. Okay? So I don't want the theory when, it's, uh, when I, I think of two things being compatible, I don't want to, to, you to change which, is, which are the relevant objects but I'm requiring that these two things be the same if both of them are real values. Think of zero, one. Uh, but if one of them is a star, it's okay. So star is compatible both with zero and with one. Okay, so this is what two descriptions are going to be saying to be that are compatible. Uh, the notion of an extension says that, okay, two things are basically compatible. So they have the same the same predicates have the same number of, uh, of uh, variables. Uh, moreover, if uh, I want to say that D prime is the extension, it is richer, so if D specified a value which is not an, a star, a specific value, D prime has to agree with that value, okay, so, but not necessarily the other way around, so it might be the case, what I want it to be the case is that D would put some stars that D prime fills in with specific values, say zero or one, okay? Okay, um, this structure of descriptions is going to work both for reality and for the representation. So the representation that we're gonna have is something like um, player one, player two, etc. 
The, what I am going to have on the reality side could be, you know, the U.S., Iran, or something like that. Okay, so on the reality side, I want you to think of entities that designate things that you read about in the newspaper, and in the um, representation, there'll be P1, P2, okay, objects inside the model. And the idea is going to be that we're going to look for a mapping here. Okay, so let me skip it. On. This is it's just messy, but it's, let me see what it's, what the point is, okay? The point is that when you do, when you construct a model, you take things in reality and you map them into things in your model. Like you say, the US is going to be player one, Iran's going to be player two. Or alternative, if you like, you could take here uh, President Obama and Congress and map them into player one and player two separately, okay? It's up to you when you do the mapping. But you tell me which of the real life, the names that designate things in real life, map to things in your model. Then a theory is something that takes things inside the, the representation and extends it. Okay, so it, take, it says, if you have seen this kind of situation with these players and these preferences, that's what's going to happen. And then what we do is take it back and see, okay, what can we say about reality given the theory? What does the theory say about reality? So that's basically the act of modeling, finding a mapping using the theory which lives here in the formal side and mapping it back to see what it tells us about reality. Now, sometimes we have other things that go directly from one description to another in the real world. The simplest case would be an experiment or data. Okay? So without theory, I started with a certain description of what what was there, and then I tell you what my observations were. Okay. In other cases, this could be the decision that would go back to the... the, the, the but the, the, there's a D, um, the moving from DR to DR double prime is something that happens without the theory. Okay, so the simplest case would be just observations. We saw that this was the description of the situation before we, we collected data, sorry. And DR double prime is after we collected data. And now to see if it is compatible with the theory, I'll ask you, okay, if you were to apply your wonderful theory, would you find the same? Okay, so if you were to model, take the notions here, model them in your um, model here. So I use the word that. So you could generate fee, use this fee to generate a description, apply the theory, map it back, let's see, are these two things together the same? Does the diagram commute? If the diagram commutes, then the theory has not been refuted, everything is great. Okay? Or, um, does the theory necessitate a certain prediction? So, is it the case that when you go from here to there, you'll find a certain prediction? But here the point is that this phi is not unique. Okay, so, some of the things I skipped were that informally we have some notion of what are reasonable mappings. Again, I'm not mapping, not trying to model what is reasonable. I take it as given. Okay, the kind of things that don't put me in an asylum defines the set of fees that I can use. And now there are two ways to complete it. Actually, a myriad of ways, but two extreme cases. One is universal quantifier. The, the other is existential quantifier. So if I want to ask you, does the theory say that from here I'm going to go down here, I can use strong necessitation that would say, is it the case that for every reasonable model phi you would end up with this? Or a weak necessitation that says, is it the case that there exists one that does the job? Okay. And this, I think, is the capture some of the, of the four distinctions that we had before. Okay. So if you, in many cases in science, you don't have so much freedom with this, okay? So if I think about simple Newtonian physics and, physics and ask you what would happen if I, um, okay, if I take this chair and I push it on this side. So you could have a prediction when you take the chair as one body, or someone else can say, wait a minute, there are a couple of bodies here because it has legs and it has a stand and I can decompose them and there are powers that are, there are certain forces that work between them. So you could say that even in simple Newtonian physics, there is more than one fee. But luckily for Newtonian physicists, the prediction is going to be the same. Okay. Not much is going to change whether you analyze the chair as one body or whether you take it apart and you take into account the, the force between them. Unfortunately for us, it's not so easy. 
we will get different predictions when we have different mappings. Whether you think about the U.S. as, a president, as the player or as the president as the player, you will think of it differently if the outcome is only monetary or the outcome includes some pride and other payoffs. Okay. Um, so that's, that's basically it. So the idea is just only to say that uh, these are just formalities and as I told you, it's, it's messy and long. Uh, just to show that you could say something with it, there are two simple propositions about problems being NP-hard. So if I give you a certain prediction, then uh, there are so many moving parts here that it's probably, it's not so difficult to prove that you could embed into it all kind of combinatorial problems. Uh, both weak necessity and strong necessity uh, turn out to be uh, complex problems. So there's, there'll be some um, originality needed in order to tell whether uh, something is necessitated by the theory um, strongly or weakly. Both of them actually have too many combinatorial, uh, too much combinatorial freedom to have a simple algorithm solution. Uh, so the conclusion is only that uh, the distinction between strong and weak necessitation captures some of the, uh, the four distinctions. So if I'm thinking about a theory, ideally a theory is something that is unique fee or more or less unique fee. Okay, so I'm thinking about what is a country and what is growth. Yes, sometimes you want, might want to split it, and we know of countries that want to split into uh, to more than one country exactly because consider of considerations of growth, but basically we know what we're talking about. Okay? So we can measure growth this way or that way, but it's not, you don't have the same kind of freedom that you have that as compared to decision theory where you can decide what an outcome is or who is the player and what's the time horizon and you're much less committed. So refuting a theory is something that is um, relatively, uh, it's, it's closer to the, um, so a theory necessitates something and in order to refute it it's en enough to have one mapping that doesn't do the job. It's harder to refute a paradigm or a conceptual framework because in order for me to show you that the conceptual framework survives, it's enough that I find out one mapping for which it works, such as saying, no, the outcome is not only monetary, the outcome also includes psychological payoffs or something like that. Is something objectively rational versus subjectively rational? So for objective rationality, I want every reasonable person, so I want every reasonable fee to give you the same kind of answer, and they would conclude that it's... Um, Whatever, it's dangerous to smoke. I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just saying it's dangerous. Uh, subjective rationality only says it's enough for me to defend my decision to find one particular fee that defends my, my choice. Okay? So I, if I can construct one model that shows that this is uh, what the theory suggests, say expected utility maximization, whatever, I'm fine with the subjective rationality. Uses of decision theory models, okay, this map this is very close to the previous one, so again, the classical examples of uh, operations research would be of every feat, objectively given, any way you're going to map it, you're going to find the same solution. What's the right investment? Well, you have a lot of freedom there. Still, there's value in, in asking whether there exists such a fee, but it's a different question than asking whether it's true for all. And finally, the role of economics, where if you think about it as a standard science that generates predictions that are refutable, etc., it's closer to the view of physics that says, yes, if there is some freedom in your mapping of the fee, it's probably not so important, okay? Whether you use this or the other, where you, it's, you should probably get the same answers. And then every refutation is a refutation. By contrast, if you think of economics as a field of criticism, it says what we do in order to, to earn our keep is basically just to wait until someone else says something stupid and then we save a lot of money and maybe lives by showing that something else was stupid, then we don't need for that to have uh, something that is strongly necessitated by any mapping. It's enough to say, look, what you've said is not even weakly necessitated because no mapping that you could come up with justified this silly thing that you've just stated, and therefore you should better not do it. Um, okay, I should stop here. <laughs>